Good evening, everybody. I, ho I hope you had a nice dinner. And I think after dinner, you tend to be a bit sleepy, okay? <laughs> because it's such a good meal. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting us, my husband swimming as well, me. I think we have been in, uh, we visited this church years and years ago when Hua Yong was the pastor. Probably 30 years, 30 over years ago. Okay, we came and visited him. And then, of course, we, Choi Kuin is a very dear friend. <laughs> we served together in track. Uh, and I'm glad I'm invited today. And even before we go and into detail what we are going to share about, can we go to the Lord in prayer? Lord, we thank you even for this time where we can gather to celebrate. Truly, it is a good thing to celebrate your goodness in our lives and your goodness to us as a church. And so, Lord, even as we contemplate this evening, talk about Chinese culture, we want to ask, Lord, that you will speak to us so that we will understand more for those of us who are Chinese descent, more of what our culture meant for us. And those of us who are not Chinese, you, we, they will begin to understand and appreciate a little bit more what are the things that their Chinese friends and Chinese brothers and sisters in Christ believe in and what they do. So we commit our time to you, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. I have entitled my message, uh, Chinese Traditions, Chinese Traditions, and Christian response. So what I'm going to do is, this evening we are going to look at some of the things that Chinese do. And as Christians, as believers, how would we respond? Being both a Chinese and a Christian. Okay, we look at, look at what is culture. Okay, culture, it, it, they define it as it's a sum total of life. So for example, we are Chinese, Chinese have our own Chinese culture. And it is different from, let's say, Indian culture, Malay culture, British culture, because it includes different things that we do. For example, our attitude, example, our belief system, our language, our customs, our rituals, what we do, our behavior as a people group, our faith, our religion, the food we eat, Chinese food very different from Indian food or Malay food or lesser Italian food and so on, and then art, drama, and music. So in another sense, culture is actually read as the way of life for an entire society. Okay, so we are, I think most of us here probably 80% are Chinese. So it is how we live as Chinese. Okay, and, and how about... What is tradition there? There was Chinese. And tradition, we talk about the specific practices, specific customs and beliefs. They are passed down from generation to generation. Okay, so the father and parents, one generation, what they do to show that they are Chinese, then they teach it, the second generation follow, and then the following generation. So it is more our practices. So we talk about civilization. As Chinese, we always say that Chinese is one of the oldest civilization. There are four ancient civilizations. First, you have Mesopotamia. Uh, that is where up north there, Mesopotamia. Then Egypt, the longest river the now. Then Indus Valley, that is India. And of course, China. So it is one of the four ancient civilization. How does the Chinese civilization begins. Okay, we will look at it, what the Bible say, and then we'll look at what the Chinese record say. In the biblical record, if you have, if you, those of us who read the Bible will know that but Genesis chapter one, uh, creation, Genesis chapter one talk about creation. And then when we go down, Genesis chapter three, talk about the fall of man. Okay, if you go down further, uh, when, when you go down, when you read to come to Genesis chapter 6. In Genesis chapter 6, it talks about Noah and the great flood. It talks about, it was Bible scholars time about 2, 3, 4, 8 BC. And because at that time, if you read the Bible, it said the man, he becomes so wicked, so that 
God said, no, I'm going to destroy the whole human race. And then God sent rain. It rained for 40 days. Then it flooded for 150 days. Then 370 days, they were in the up. So one year and a little bit more, 365. More, can you imagine if you are trapped in that ark for 170 days? I think when my husband and I went to US three years ago, we actually went to the place where they have the reconstruction of the Noah's ark. That was in Kentucky. If you were to go to US, make it a point, we travel all the way to Kentucky, it, the, a reconstruction of the whole up, different level, huge. It was an experience. And also it's the same, about the same place, we also went to the place where in the US, we purposely make a trip there to see the tabernacle, the construction of the live tabernacle. If you will have a chance to go to the US, go ahead and do that. And then in Genesis chapter 8, when talk about Mount Arara, it landed Mount Arara, Genesis 8 chapter 4, chapter 4, Eight, verse 4, and then it says, when Noah came out, there was a rainbow, okay? And then the scripture record, when the, when the flood came, everyone in the, in the world at that time was destroyed, but only eight were saved. Noah, his wife, his three sons, Shem, Heth, and Japheth, and their three wives. And then when you come to Genesis chapter 8, verse 20, it states that, then Noah built an altar to the Lord. He sacrificed. You remember when you said when the animals came into the ark two by two, but Noah made preparation. There were some clean animals. He brought in seven. Why? Because he God wanted to be uh, he wanted to sacrifice, and that was Noah's religion. Noah's religion is a sacrifice to God. So that was, and then when we continue to look at Genesis 11, it talk about Tower of Babel. That was the Tower of Babel, biblical scholars say that about 101 years later, after the Noah's up, about 2247 BC, and then at that time, the Bible said that in Genesis 11, the whole world has one common language. So everybody understand everybody, okay? And then in verse 3, or verse 2, it said the people moved east and settled in Shina. That is verse 2. And Bible scholars said that Shina there actually referred to Babylonia. That is in verse 2. And then verse 3, when the people get together, they said, let us make bread in verse 3. And verse 4, it said, let us build for ourselves and make a name for ourselves. That was in 11 verse 3 and 4. Then we continue. Then, but God saw. God saw what was happening. And God, he said, let us, so there's a triune God. No, it's not one. Father, Son, Spirit. He said, let us go down. And, and he said that, and because when God goes down, comes on the people, because God knew it was the pride of the people who want to make a name for themselves. They said they want to build a tower so high, they reach out to God. They want to be God himself. And so God confused their language in verse 7. And then after that, in verse 8, the people start moving off. Because suddenly you can't understand each other, then they started moving away. And in verse 9, it talk about they when move away, is a different nation. Okay, that is the origin of the Chinese civilization. Let's look at Chinese record. That was what the Bible state. Well, look at Chinese record. Chinese records of the China's first dynasty, the Xia, Xia Chao, Xia Chao, started in about 2205 BC. And then, whereas the Tower of Babel we mentioned, the incident happened in 2247 BC. So it's a difference of 42, 40. Uh, 42 years. So the time it took from the Chinese people to go from migrate to China from Babylonia is about 42 years. Okay? You, if you look at, I show it in a, in a slide. Okay, on the left, okay, on the right, Xia Dynasty is 2205 BC. On the left, Tower of Babel, 2247 BC, it is only a span of 
42 years. And Bible scholars said that is a time the Chinese, early Chinese moved from Iraq to China. There are two historical facts that we can prove that. First, in Chinese history, if you look in the Chinese history, there was a record of flood. And there is, there, there is a you, you, the Chinese know what. It talked about a water everywhere. And we knew that because if you look at those who know Chinese, how many of us here read and write Chinese? <laughs> oh, not bad. Okay, so you are not totally banana. You are half, half banana and we know, like me, la, more English than Chinese, but I can, I can know, that's Chuan, I know. La. Okay, the word Chuan, a boat, actually consists of a vessel, okay, on the left, the vessel, and on top there, there's number eight, and on the ko, ko means people. So what does this remind you of? Noah's art, right? When Noah's art landed among Arara, only eight people were said there was a boat and there were eight people. Another historical fact, okay, but it is a Chinese border sacrifice. Okay, the Shu Jing, the Chinese oldest Chinese history book, it records that in the year 2230 BC, the Emperor Shou sacrificed to Shangti. And what is the meaning of Shangti? Shang means upright. Shang Ti means the emperor. Okay, a Shang Ti means the emperor that is very high up. Okay, it's a supreme ram, ruler or the emperor above. Okay, so above Shang Ti, Shang is above somebody who is even higher than your emperor. Who can it be that is higher than your emperor? If you look at what we talk about so far. The god of the ancient Chinese, the ancient Chinese religion, actually, they worship the god of the Bible. Because from Noah, in the Chinese history, it talk about Noah. It talk about a boat. It talk about eight people being saved. And at that time, what they, they uh, worship is actually similar. It's the same god of the Bible. And by Chinese scholars, when they do research, they find that the Cantonese. How many of us here are Cantonese? Me. Wow, quite a lot of Cantonese. Huh? The Cantonese is actually the most ancient dialect of the Chinese. Wow, we are Chinese Cantonese. We're happy. Yeah? Whereas we talk about Mandarin now. Mandarin is only in use about the last 500 and 600 years. So when we actually, we will talk about Sangti. The Cantonese will tell me, how do you say Sangti in Cantonese? Xiong Tai, right? Okay, doesn't it sound like El Shaddai? Right? El Shaddai, Xiong Tai. So it sounds similar to El Shaddai. So the most common word they use to describe the deity that the ancient Chinese worship. So it showed that uh, quite a proof, or actually a strong indication that the ancient Chinese actually worship El Shaddai because they call it Xiong Tai. Okay? Whereas, we will, the, there's a gap of 1,400 years before the first dynasty, the Xia Chao, and the main religion of China, the ancient Chinese actually worship Sangti or Xiang Tai. Okay? The number of that words, the number of times the word Xiang Tai or Xiang Ti appear in the ancient Chinese writing is the 980 times. There's a lot, right? In the Chinese classic. And it is, it is the evidence that the ancient Chinese actually worship the God of the Bible. Okay, another place, those of us who have been to China, my husband and I haven't been, if you have a chance, we like to go. And if you go to Beijing, it's the Temple of Heaven. There's a historical site. And then it, it is situated in Beijing, and this big complex, the emperors of the Ming and Qing dynasty were every year to go there to pray to the heaven. That's why it's called Temple of Heaven, for a good harvest. But if you go inside the Temple of Heaven, any one of you have visited Temple of Heaven? Okay, verify whether I'm saying it true, because I, this is, I ask Mr. Google and look for pictures in Mr. Google. I haven't been there. He said, in the Temple of Heaven, you actually don't have any deity. Is it true? Don't have any statue. For example, you go to any temple here, you say Kwan Kong, uh, uh, 
uh, all the deity, but in the temple of heaven, there's no idol and there's no object of worship. So what does it tell us? It tells us the ancient Chinese don't worship all these idols that our relatives that are not non-believers worship. They actually worship a God that is no form. It's a God who is the heavenly father. So the origin of the Chinese religion is actually Shangdiism. Whereas at the moment, our present day Chinese religion, when we, if all the non-Christians, if they ask what is your religion, do you know in the, in the government they call you Buddha? <laughs> what is your religion? Christian. If you, are, if you are not a Christian, they actually put the Buddha. So they say, what is your religion, Buddha? Our present day Chinese religion is actually a assimilation of Taoism, Confucianism, as well as Buddhism, which came actually quite late, 73 AD. Okay, so we from here we know that Chinese originally we don't worship Buddha, we don't worship um, uh, Confucius, or we don't worship Tao, but we worship Santi. Okay, today I'm going to talk about cultural practices and Chinese religion. Okay, when I was talking to Auntie Choi Green, Pastor Choi, I always call Auntie Choi Green, <laughs> Pastor Choi Green, Reverend Choi Green. <laughs> Then I realized I do not know what is the expectation. You might have expected me to tell you about Chinese New Year tradition. If that is what you thought, you might be disappointed because that is not what I'm going to talk today. Okay? In SSMC, I've given a series of lectures, uh, uh, sermon and so on. If you just go to ssmt.com.my slash Christian culture series, there is a total, I think I've done a total about 10 sermons on this, okay, on different things. And um, so if you look at it about Christian faith, uh, about half the sermons that are about Chinese New Year tradition. So if you want to find out, you can go there. Then next one, then you have a uh, Chinese culture and Christ. There are two parts where I talk about different Chinese festival, mid-autumn festival, dragon boat festival, and so on. Then I did about two or three like a sermon on what is the Christian response to Qingming. That was just before Qingming. And then what about food offered to idols? What, do, what is a Christian response to that? Another sermon that I talk about is Chinese funeral practices. Okay, so I will, you, you can just check out SSMC website in one series. And today's sermon, I asked Pastor Chai Kun's uh, uh, permission to actually post it there because what I'm dealing with you today, I have not dealt with previously, okay? So what is the Christian response? And what is the Christian and Chinese cultural practices? We are Chinese and we can't deny that. And I'm proud to be a Chinese because Chinese have a very rich, long culture. Our culture is sorry, a civilization, one of the oldest civilization, but I am a Christian. And I want to make sure what I practice as a Christian will not go against culture or will not, uh, or rather I will not be influenced by culture to do what do not please God. So when we ask what is it, some people ask, oh brother, we are now living a 20th century, not in the stone age. You can do whatever you like, okay? Then some people say, uh, some of these things that we do, maybe Chinese do or but I will not do it because if you are true Christian, you will not practice any events associated with worship of the pagan god. Okay? Some people say, why not? Christian join in other pagan service ones like Halloween. Some people say Easter and Christmas, the pagan origin and so on. And and some people think that depends on how extreme you are. If you are Chin Chai Chin Chai Christian, anything also go, you can do what you like. But you are more extreme Christian than you can say this cannot, that cannot, and so on. So it's really up to you. So what are some of the considerations? Okay. I think we, we, we consider ourselves tripartite. We have a body, we have a soul, and we have a spirit. Okay. Body means what we are, our humanity. Soul means our culture. 
Okay, because we are Chinese, we are Chinese culture, and religion, or uh, our religious, what do we believe in? Okay, because, like for example, I'm a person, okay, I'm Kok Moi, I'm a Chinese, and because I'm a Christian, I have to consider. If I'm a, a person who is a Chinese, but let's say who is a Buddhist, or there are some Chinese, maybe uh, Hindus, or there's Chinese who may be atheists. So their practices would be different. So we have to consider two things. Whatever you look at, we consider whether it's cultural, every practice that we look at, whether it is cultural or whether it is religious. And I want to introduce to you the three R principle. Okay, first R is retain. Second R is reject. Third R is redeem. And what is it that we need to retain? Anything that is cultural and beneficial. Okay, Chinese culture is so rich, we can't just throw everything out. There are some that are really good and very beneficial. What do we reject? Anything that is religious, that is demonic, that is superstitious, we will reject. And what is it that we redeem? Things that are neutral, we can redeem for the glory of God. Okay, if we go back, if you look at this, about half the sermon I talk about Chinese New Year. So I will not be talking about Chinese New Year, but today I want to deal with something I have not dealt with before. Okay, I'm going to talk about three important life events in any person. First one is birth. Okay, all of us have, will be born. If we were not born, we will not be here. Secondly, second in marriage. Okay, if most of us, some of us may not be married because the Lord, for whatever reason, have called us to singlehood. But marriage is a big part of our, uh, of our life. And of course, the third one, whether you like it or not, one day we will say bye-bye. We will die. So these are the three areas we'll talk about. Okay? We are going to look at each, what going to, each life event, what are the traditional practices, and then we will apply the three R principle to find out whether it is something we should retain, something we should reject, or something we can redeem. Firstly, we talk about pregnancy, childbirth, and postpartum. Postpartum means after pregnancy. For example, during pregnancy, the pregnant woman, once you are, if, if you are married, uh, your mother-in-law or your mom will make sure tan tong, uh, give you a lot of nutritious food, right? Nutritious soup. And also, you will have a very sufficient rest. Okay, I remember when we were, when I was pregnant, hey, you don't work, like, huh? you rest. Uh, huh? When a family function, you rest, you rest. So I will tell, enjoy it, enjoy it. <laughs> Once you, after you give birth, you may not have the same privilege. And that is good. I think really, a, a mother that is pregnant needs extra nutrition. Okay, um, and it will, it will need sufficient rest for the baby to grow because if you're too strenuous exercise, it could endanger the baby. Okay. And then there are some people you must uh, avoid pineapple. Because if you have pineapple, eat too much pineapple, you might have the risk of uh, being, what do you call, uh, aborted. Okay? And you must avoid lamb. I remember when I was carrying our first child when I was working in Kuala Lipis, I went to the market and I wanted to buy mutton. And the guy looked at me, I'm not going to sell you. I'm not going to sell I will not sell you. Because if anything happened to your baby, you might blame me. Because young. Okay? And then they said, Fat young too. So they have the, 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 and then this one, you see, whether I don't think we should follow because it is more superstitious, okay? It is not medically proven that if you take lamb, then you have epilepsy. Then you see all the Indians and Malays, they all have epilepsy, right? Because lamb is their main diet, okay? And then, of course, they, they say no moving furniture, no renovating houses, okay? You say you are pregnant. I think the reason you should not, you should not, uh, the, the probably reason is you should not be doing too much work. But I get, okay, if you have, if you move furniture, you use scissors, you use sharp knife, you hammer nail and so on. There is, there could be the danger your child will have cleft lip. Okay? So, and then avoid, okay, I remember when I had my third child, those of us who know her, Unhui, lovely girl, but she was born of cleft lip and palate. And I know people are whispering, 
Ha, huh, I think she very clever la. When she was pregnant, she probably used nail la. She probably used scissors. That's why her baby is born with cleft lip palate. That is nonsense. Okay, of course, as a medical doctor, we actually thought about it. What happened? And I, I was not sure because my sister is a gynecologist. She delivered my baby and I talked to her. Because I remember, because we look at embryology, okay, where the baby developed. And then they say about six or seven weeks, there's not a baby developed about, and then it's like zip, it just sold up. Okay, when I thought back, when I was six or seven weeks pregnant with Unhui, I actually have uh, chicken pox. Okay, so whether that could be the infection of the chicken pox have somehow disrupted the joining process and at that part, it wasn't joined. So I don't know. So I asked my sister, actually, when my daughter was born, there was a pediatric embryologist that was visiting HKL and I went to see him and I asked him. He said, it's an interesting thought, but they would not. They don't, they don't have enough cases to actually find out whether that could be the cause. But whether it is cause or no cause, but we thank God that God was with us. And those of us who know my daughter, pretty young lady, you, had, you could see just a minimal scar on the face because of a cleft lip, but we thank God. I think through her, our experience with her, giving birth to her and bringing her up, it gives us a lot more compassion and love for other people. Okay, so they say you avoid looking at ugly project, uh, objects so people, pregnant women will pose on their wall, beautiful baby and so on. Yeah, go ahead. But don't have the idea that that will make your baby pretty nonsense, okay? How about birth? Okay. Olden days, males are not allowed at childbirth. Okay, let me ask how many of you, the husband and miss, were there with your wife during the delivery? Okay, and I'm sure that the wife, we are so glad our husband was with us during delivery because it really gave us a sense of uh, security, sense of happiness because our spouse goes through it with us. So earlier years, I don't for whatever reason, males are not allowed. And then choosing the name. Okay, names are very important. Okay, even if you look at Bible, biblical, they choose name carefully. Uh, choosing a name is very important because it is a lot of time what we as parents want for our child. Okay? In Chinese name, a lot of us are three character names. Okay? There are some people, because most of our family name is one, okay? but there are two people with two family, like uh, some people with two family name, uh, uh, what? Ao Yang. Ao Yang said two. Okay? And most of us have three names, but there are some people with two names. We all know our Hua brothers, Hua Yong, Hua Jian, Hua Che. Maybe we can ask them why your parents only give you two names and not three names. But most of us will have family name, like me, Wu, that's my family, and the generational name, Guo, okay, and then my third name, my own name is Mei. Okay, because the some of us, some family actually have a genealogical record by generation you can know. Like Swimming's family, he's sweet, but he's a yellow one. He's a different Eng from me. He's a yellow. So if you look at Eng Sui, you check, right? Because if you, if you follow the, the generation, all the Eng Sui are probably cousins, okay? Because they, they follow, and that is something very good, okay? Of course, the May, like my family, all the girls have flower. Ying la, Mei la, Tao la, Liu la, so family. So I think it is something good, something cultural, we would like, we should maintain, okay? Of course, a lot of time nowadays, we may not follow that we, if like, for example, he's sweet, when his eldest brother had the first child, he wanted the un tian, okay? God's grace. So un tian, so he started un, everybody un na. So un te, un yi, un yao, un hui. So everybody follows. So it's also good that we know they are cousins, that generation, okay? And of course, Sometimes people look at Zodiac year of birth, okay? And this one, if, if you want to know more about Zodiac, one of the earlier lecture, uh, sermon I dealt with actually talked a bit more about the 12 animals and how, and it is, it is the Chinese belief that 
which year you are born in, it is that year it kind of ruled by the animals. And I think as believers, we should not follow that. And can you imagine? That's why they said this year long. Uh, this year people say sure a lot of babies. <laughs> because everybody wants the long zi, long lui, uh, Okay. But for example, if you have a child, if you have that, you have a child that born a year of pig. You know, some people say, pig la, you're so lazy. You know, it bring into the child's psyche. If my mom, my dad keep telling me I'm born a year of pig, and I'm, I'll be lazy. Okay, so I think as believers, I think God determines when we are born. And God determines where we are born. It is God who determines. We should not follow that. And, and then I, when I was doing uh, my research, first time I read about it, uh, in the Chinese tradition, I do not know whether anyone follow, when the child's first birthday, they actually give a child a tray with different items there, they call the grabbing test. Wow, well, Pastor Choi Gin, she, she, you know, you know. Okay? Huh? Oh, see, movie. Uh. <laughs> so you see more movie than me. <laughs> so they say if the child grab, let's say the child uh, grab a, a castle, so probably it'll be a musician. Okay? So I think we should not do that. Okay? And I think, can you imagine if your child grab something that you, uh, something that's a, a, a leak. I said, yeah, my child grew up a sure farmer. It built into you. You build into your child. I think we should not follow that. Confinement. Okay? A confinement is a, during the confinement month, you strict restriction regarding the diet, the hygiene, the household related. Yeah, it is cultural. And I think it is something good because a mother after giving birth, needs to rest okay and i think this is from earlier years not our general earlier general women actually do housework throughout the year they probably the one month is the only time she get to rest as you get to get good food okay so and then you have special food and drink for the mother to rebuild her health that's very good okay but then i have young ladies coming to me and crying say, she was in the bedroom. She called me from a bedroom. My mom refused to let me bathe for 10 days and don't re refuse to let me wash my hair for two weeks or four weeks. Okay? And I, I think this are uh, not a good practice. I think, I think personal hygiene is important. Okay? I remember I was in Kuala Libis. Uh, I, I came down to KL to give birth to my first son. Because my sister is a gynecologist in, in GHKL. So birth already, she, she came out about evening. Then the very next morning, my sister said, you better go home. <laughs> because hospital is not a good place. If you are well, the baby is well. It's not a good place to stay because you probably get infection. So the next morning, we drove from KL back to Lipis. And guess what I did? I shower. <laughs> I think my mother-in-law probably eyes will pop up. But I think... Of course, nowadays we're okay, lah, huh? We have warm water. So because I think those days you, you are worried you they get a chill or something. But nowadays the water, I think personal hygiene is very important. Okay? And then avoid wind, uh, avoid air conditioning, open window. These are practices that traditionally Chinese practice, but which we shouldn't be following. Okay? Um, and sometimes the cons uh, the Chinese believe that during the period postpartum is unclean, considered unclean, and no, no sexual intercourse. Of course, of course, it is a, a woman needs to rest. Okay, I still remember a pastor, a very godly pastor, he told the church, he told the man, yeah, after delivery, your, your wife will probably have no urge for sexual intercourse because she needs to rest, and you have to give her the space. She will respond when she recover. Okay? So, and then some binding of the stomach, okay, probably maybe we want to look nice, uh -huh, tie of the stomach, but I think even the Malays, they even meant more than that. Okay, so these are some of the confinement. We, we need to look at it, whether it is something that we should do or not do. Okay, full moon celebration after one year. In the olden tradition, you always shave. Okay, shave. And when I had unhui, Somebody told me at one month, my mother-in-law told me, 
they actually cut the cut the eyelashes of the baby. I said, no, no, no. If I make me see pop, because they believe that if you cut that at one month, then the the eyelashes will grow very long and no, ah, uh, no, I, I don't want to take the the hair shaving. And a lot of time in the olden Chinese, they dedicate to the deities for protection. Okay, they say as pastors when we go through baptism from non-Christian family, a lot of time they have been kaya, kai bei kunyam na, kai bei which one, and it's a lot of time is done during full moon. But do we need to do that? No, we don't need to do that. Okay, because we know that we dedicate our child to the Lord. Okay. Either we dedicate, or uh, some churches do infant baptism, and some churches do infant dedication. Okay, but before that, a lot of time when the first month, the name is included, the family genealogical almanac. I brought this with you to show you. This is Swimming's family. Is the Eng the Huang? He is a different. He's a yellow Huang. Yellow. He's not my my Wu. My Wu is a Kou Tian Wu. The Eng the Huang family genealogical almanac. Okay, I think when my mom-in-law went back to China, okay, she was given this, and this is a favorite son, so it came to us, <laughs> so it's in our possession. And it, if those of us didn't read, it's actually very interesting. It talk about all the generations of the Eng family. You read, you can hear about uh, who went to, uh, who become a the the how do you do say you become a. a I mean, when you pass exam, you become what they call uh, the scholar, right? And then he also has some part talk about who goes to jail. <laughs> you know, your which generation somebody went to jail because stole chicken or something like that. But this is 1919 edition. And the last time they came back, because 90, we were not there, we were actually asked to submit our names. So I suppose the next edition that come up, our name will be there. Then you say, who marry who, and this and marry how many should. I think these are precious record. Okay, I, we are so glad we have this in our possession. It's a precious record. So, should we continue? Well, if you have, okay, we plan to go back to his hometown in of this year. We would like to see what is the latest edition of this. Okay, of course, as I just mentioned, some churches do infant baptism, and some churches encourage and some churches encourage child baptism dedication is there i think we believe that when our child is given by god and we dedicate back to god for god to use them okay okay the second area I talk about is marriage okay wedding planning okay choosing the date in chinese tradition is very important because they look at the so they will look at the Chinese almanac and then you take the, the supposedly groom, supposedly bride, your date of birth, your zodiac sign, and you check uh, whether you ngam or not ngam. Poor thing, uh, if you pack tall for five years and you want to get married and your mother say, your, support, your future mother-in-law say you shouldn't marry because your zodiac sign doesn't match and so on. And then they check a lunar calendar. Some months are good for wedding. And if you're, according to your zodiac sign, uh, you should get married this month. I think as believers, we should not follow that. Okay? We should not. I think, of course, nowadays, nowadays we will all look at when it's public holiday. Huh? <laughs> uh, when it's public holiday. And uh, when is it you maybe have an uncle from China, when, uh, US want to come back. But traditionally, olden days, they choose the day. So now, of course, we may not follow that. Okay. And then there's, a, in the, I think in the Hokkien practice, the Hokkien and Miss may correct me. Not, if there must be a lapse of time between a death and in the family and a wedding. Okay. And then some Hokkien say, you, if somebody die, let's say one of the parents die and you are planning to get married, either you get married within the six months, Right, I think Pastor Choi King your Hokkien. Ah? No. Okay. Either you get married within the six months or after three years. These are tradition and these are super, probably superstitious. But I think most of these we don't really follow nowadays. Okay, they call Tai Lai. 
And this is where the groom family will present the betrothed gift to the bride, and then bride return a portion. Okay, they will have different things, but I think usually you you the two families in the Chinese when you 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 nego you negotiate you discuss uh, so like for example when a son got married one elder son got married actually talked to Shui's mom and then she she had talked to her mother because our generation so in these sort of things if you could maintain family unity if you could maintain family peace I would suggest we give in so long as it don't come against our Christian principle okay so. So like, for example, then how, how much uh, you want and so on. And of course, in the Chinese culture, there's a dowry, okay? And then how much of it is again, depending on the families, okay? It is good because most of the time you give dowry, the parents, actually more or less, uh, it is something the parents give to the young couple as a start of life together. In that, good, in that sense, it's good, but... Make sure that it is not. We have heard horror story of how much the the bride family insists the groom must give before they marry. I think as believers we shouldn't be doing that. Okay, if we as much as I, I mean as parent as much as I can, I want to bless my children as much as I can afford. I want to give them a gift so they can start off comfortably. And of course, wedding cakes. The this one. Uh, a lot of time the girl family will request for it because in the Chinese culture, this is where you more or less inform your relative that, oh, my daughter is getting married. And so it's an invitation. So it's very cultural, but depending, for example, when Unyi wanted to get married, I spoke to uh, Shui's mom, what is that your family want? So then she, she said, in the end, she said, she called back, oh, my my. My mother said, want a siuji. So I said, yeah, no problem. But I did very nice. Yeah. Please make sure you don't worship with the siuji. Okay? Don't go and pray like lay bang. Good. But please don't go and pray. Then she said, okay. Because her, she, Shui's parents are believers, but the grandma is not a believer. But she respects us. Okay, next one. There is something called hair combing ceremony. Okay, usually the night before the wedding, the bride will do it, the groom also will do it, they will actually comb. And then I remember seeing my cousin, they said, the first comb, the, yes, saw, saw, do me. They mean you comb it from top to bottom. saw, but fat, me. They mean the second comb, that you bless you, you will be, you will be together until you're old. Your hair is white, like white hair, you're together. <laughs> Some saw, they mean the third comb is blessing you. You have children and grandchildren fill up your whole hall. So there's blessing. Okay. But do we do it? Okay. I would say that if we come from non Christian family, if your parents do it, if we, you just make sure that they can do it, but not in front of altar. A lot of time they do it in front of the altar. At the same time, they pray over it. Okay. But the next one, what I wanted to share about, what is thing that is we can redeem? One of, uh, last year, we were invited to uh, Bali for our good friend's son's wedding because swimming was conducting the wedding. And this is the first time I observed, and I saw that, I said, it can really be something that can replace the hair combing. So that night, apparently for each of their children, they got five children, this is the fourth to get married, for each one, the night before the wedding, the whole family will gather and they will talk and then they will say, uh, pray for the, the, the one who is getting married. I mean, the siblings are siblings. Uh, they choke coco, uh, last time you were small. I mean, it was a good family time. And at the end of it, the father prayed over the whole family. So I thought that was really a wonderful, wonderful thing to replace a hair combing. It gives a family togetherness. And it gives a chance to siblings to say goodbye, at least in that sense, distance why to their sibling that's getting married and pray over it. Okay? It is actually a, a prayer of blessing before the wedding. Okay? Like this family, ours, a good friend. The far, I mean, Chinese, we always veil the bride now. 
father and mother veil the bride. But after veiling the bride, the father and mother lay hands and pray for the daughter. I thought this was wonderful. And that was our son. Okay, they are not married to each other. This is our good friend's daughter. This is our son. <laughs> okay, in our house, before she had married, she was, he was actually got ready to go and fetch the bride. We are all dressed. We just lay hands on him and pray a blessing over him. I think this is really a good redeeming point for what we do as Chinese hair combing ceremony. Okay, something, next one, a lot of time, the putting the groom to the death, chuang men. Okay, this is what all the bridesmaids love to do. They bully the, the, the groomsmen, do all sorts of things. So to chase however he's determined to marry the bride and to win, and then they must negotiate uh, what they must do, jump over the wall, uh, do all sorts of things. It's fun, but I have seen cases where it was taken to an extreme. Okay, and we have cases like they make the, the guys wear bra over it, wear a band -aid. I mean, I, I think we could have good, clean fun. So we were actually quite happy when Shui's father said, no, wow, we were so glad because we have seen sometimes, no, they, they have wedding and then the wedding dinner, they project what was done during the, and some are actually not uh, very glorifying. So if our, our children get getting married, probably mention to them, good to have fun, but good, clean fun. Not something that dehumanize or embarrass them or something like that. Okay, tea ceremony, this is very, very important in the Chinese culture. It is where the bride and groom that express the respect, gratitude, appreciation to the parents and elders. Okay, it's also the time is officially welcome to the family. Or they come, auntie, uncle, now first time I said papa, mama. And also, it's also learning the official title of the different family members. Okay, VHA, and then it's also you get to know the girl who is coming in, for, get to know who is a Tai Pak la, Tai Sam la, Yi Pak la, Yi Sam, Asam Suk, and so on, all the family member. But the only thing is, in some cases, we have to tell, when we do marital counseling, tell them no serving tea to the diseased ancestor. Okay, sometimes like one of them will put a chair there, empty chair, you serve the auntie, if the uncle is passed away, you pour, okay? But what we did with our son's wedding, because by the time my son got married, he didn't have grandparents. Both our parents were gone, even swimming one, the auntie, and one the elder sister gone. So before we serve anything, we would just observe a minute of silence and thank God for our grandparents, thank God for the auntie that passed on, and thanking God for their life, okay, as a group, then we serve the living. I thought there was something we could consider instead of serving. And if you, your children or what is, or you are getting married to a non, please make sure somehow the tea pouring ceremony is not in front of the family altar. So there, so some nowadays they are quite. They put it another corner or they go to the restaurant, okay, to serve it there because. We do not want to be engaged in ancestral worship in any way. Okay, and then, and a lot of time during a tea ceremony, before, uh, besides uh, knowing that, and the couple is also given red envelopes with, with money. We always tease, tease, this is the most expensive cup of tea. <laughs> this cup of tea costs you lots of money. And a third of the time, bride is given gold jewelry. And you have a bride. Can you imagine if your mother-in-law give you that necklace? <laughs> this one. <laughs> Can you imagine? You freak out, right? <laughs> that means what is the message your mother-in-law to be going to tell you? She wants that many of grandchildren. <laughs> so when I saw this, I was quite thicker, so I must show you. I think none of us have this, right? Okay, good. Okay, and then next one, the, usually the bridal bed or matrimony bed. In some family, it's really superstitious if you're a family of girls. The Chinese is value boys, the zhong nan qing nia. So they make sure that the young girls are not allowed to sit on the bed first. They make sure a young boy roll over the bed, bridal bed first before the couple sit in. Okay, should we do that? 
No, right? If there's something very superstitious, we shouldn't be doing that. But what I would say, more important to prepare for the marriage. It's more important to prepare for our marriage than just the wedding ceremony. And here, I would like to strongly encourage, go for alpha marriage preparation. Do you have that in your church? Okay. Alpha marriage preparation. We, we, we have it at least once a year, especially those who are contemplating marriage. Okay. We usually put them through the alpha marriage preparation. The alpha about five sessions, similar to marriage class, but at a preparing them for marriage. Of course, they don't do the part of sexual, uh, sexual intimacy. And then after that, we send them to one-to-one marital, uh, pre-marital counsel. I think it's good to spend time preparing our young people, okay, rather than spend so much time getting the wedding ceremony. Okay, the third one we'll talk about is uh, death rituals and funeral practices. Okay, if you are not a Christian, you're not a believer, then most likely it will be either be a Taoist rite or a Buddhist rite. What is the difference? A Taoist rite, they have the, the talk of yin and yang. So in the Taoist rite, you have a Taoist priest. They were doing a lot of things, uh, doing, let them, the family will go round and round and round the coffee many, many times. And each time go round, you're supposed to take the disease from one level of hell to the, another level until finally it goes through the escape from hell to the, to the paradise, okay? Whereas in the Buddhist right, the Buddhists will believe that a lot of chanting. And then when you chant, the more you chant, the longer you chant, you actually transfer merits to the disease so that he can go to the, uh, they are sort of heaven. And then they will be reincarnated in 49 days. Another thing that is in the non-Christian setup, they believe that when a person dies, the soul goes into three parts, okay? One is in the person going to the, uh, the tomb, the, and one is in the ancestral tablet, and one lie with a person. So that when somebody dies in the house, for example, first thing they'll do, they cover all the mirror, they cover all the glass surfaces. Their fear is when the soul leaves the body, you see his face on the mirror on the, or the glass, he will recite there and don't leave. <laughs> so I think this is really superstitious, okay? We, do, we should not be following that. How about barrier? Okay? A lot of time when the coffin, whether leaving the house or even leaving the funeral parlor, when that happen, you look around, you can recognize who are believers and who are not believers, because all the non-believers will turn, turn away because they don't want to see. But I like it. One, one pastor, there were years ago, before we took the, the uh, casket out of the house, he told us, please don't turn away your face. This is her, his or her last journey out of the house. Respect, honor, and let it, let the thing pass. Let the coffin pass. So, Generally, we will face a coffin and say goodbye, don't turn away, okay? And then, of course, there's a procession, and then, and then when the, you lower the coffin into the ground, and at the same time, then you will have to make sure the Chinese believe in feng shui, okay? And then look at the tomb and so on, okay? Do we believe in it? No, I don't think so. But of course, we wanted to, usually, we, actually, nowadays, there are not much chance for you to choose where is a barrier plot and so on. Okay, so generally it's either barrier or cremation. Okay, okay we, nowadays we go to the crematorium. And nowadays, I don't know why you may, the person may die and then you've got to wait three days before you can cremate because it's all jam-packed. Okay, in the crematorium, after cremation, the ashes you can either scatter into the sea or you can place in the urn in a temple, okay? Or you can place in the colibrium, that's us and our goddaughter in Penang, so there's a colibrium. Or you enter it and put it in another grave. Then my sister's, when she was, because she had told us specifically, if she passed on, she wants the ashes to be put in my mom's grave. 
So we took it back to Saramban and we prepared Anna because my, I have another sister who is single and she wanted. So actually, I get two places ready. Okay, so these are what you can do with the ashes. Okay, so some question we want to ask. Should Christian attend Chinese funeral? How many said yes? How many said no? Okay, yeah, I think we should because, okay, firstly, it is a testimony. Okay, we are the light of the world. And when we attend a Chinese funeral, it is a testimony. Okay, I remember in Kuala Lipis, there was a man who stayed behind us, the road. He was having cancer, so we went to talk to him. We shared with him the gospel. And he actually accepted Christ in the face of it, where the wife, uh, where the wife was there. He accepted Christ. But then he passed away. So the wife came and asked me whether I'm okay. The, because he is the only son in Nanyang. The other, the other son is in China. The family desire is for him to a Chinese Chinese funeral right. He asked me, I said, no issue. Please go ahead because it's a family decision. So then so he had a Chinese right in Lipis and the church member, we all went for the, the wake service and she was so shocked and she was so pleased. She thought we might be offended and we will stay away. I think there is a testimony. Okay, we should attend Chinese funeral. And then, also, we should not have fear because the one who is in us is greater than the one who is in the world. Okay, even amidst the chanting, amidst the, the monk, amidst the Buddhist uh, monk, no issue because who is in us is greater. We will not be oppressed. And thirdly, and it is a, it is a comfort. The Bible actually says that Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 2, it's better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. Okay, uh, a very dear sister told me if I have a choice to go to a birthday party or go to the funeral, I will choose to go to the funeral. Because birthday, I can still come to your birthday party next year. Okay, so okay, should Christian participate in Chinese funeral rites? There's something different. Okay, let's look at some of the rites. We have to retain whatever is cultural and beneficial. For example, we have the honor and respect. Okay, we go to a Chinese funeral because let's say it's a church member or your friend, father, or mother, or grand, we respect because they are our auntie, we respect them, we honor them. And there's a difference between Xiao Jing and Xiao Sun. Xiao Jing means we respect. Xiao Sun means we actually follow. Okay, then next thing, please. Okay, and then it's always good to give the deceased a very proper and dignified farewell. Okay, and when we, when we participate in Chinese funeral rites, it's always memories of the deceased. When we go to a funeral parlor, Chinese funeral parlor, we spend time with the family, talk to the family, comfort them, okay, and this will help in their grieving process. And also, of course, we always give a white gift, it helps the family in the expenses. Okay, what are the things that we should reject? Okay, anything that religious and demonic. Of course, when we go there, we will not participate in any of their rites. And we will not hold joystick, we will not do any practice, any superstitious practices, and we will not worship. Okay, next one. What are the things that we can redeem? Neutral. Okay, there is something about Chinese funeral that I appreciate is a family order. Okay, if you go to a Chinese funeral, you look at it, you know who are the children, you know who are the grandchildren, you know who are the great-grandchildren. Okay, and for example, they have this one, the, the, can I have the next slide? Okay, you have some with a red patch. So immediately you know this is a daughter, this is a daughter-in-law, this is a son, this is a son-in-law, and these are grandson, of the maternal side, grandson, paternal side. And I think this is cultural, no religious significance. And I wish, for example, in, in a, child, a Christian funeral, for example, we can say, maybe all the children should come in black or white and all the grandchildren come in blue or something. Maybe we can think about that, something that can redeem to show that we are 
Christians, and yet we appreciate Chinese culture. What are the things we can redeem? Okay, and and then the other thing is ancestral corner. I saw there's an ancestral tablet for the Chinese Chinese non-Christian. They will pray. I think about seven days or something. Or be within forty nine. They will invite the spirit back home, and spirit is supposed to enter the family ancestral tablet. Okay. But I think one thing we can redeem in our family, we sometimes we have photograph. Okay, we probably can put somebody who will pass on, but put another corner, so we know we may still we don't take away their photograph just because they are gone. But we respect them. I think there's something we can redeem. Okay, it's an ancestral corner for photograph of the dearly beloved for ourselves and our future generation. Okay, some but some practical consideration. Okay, if the funeral is on your family or relative. You should be present. It will be terrible if you are the only Christian in the family, and at your parent or grandparent funeral, you are not there. Because you say this is not a great. And what message are you sending to your non-Christian relative? Okay, be present, and you be intentionally, actively involved in all the preparation, except religious rites. Okay. And be a financial contributor. Okay, you can. You, we should contribute at least equal amount. And if you are capable, you can contribute more to show that this is my way of respecting my parent. And you are a tower of strength. And what if a non-family member? Okay, you be present. You bow in respect. Do not hold jaw statement. We go and nowadays they give you flowers to put there. We just very politely decline. Okay, we will just bow. We just view the body respectfully, and then we'll pray. Especially if our church members, whose parents or grandparents are non-believers, we will make sure we are there, and we will spend some time with the family, and we will take the Christian aside and pray for them, and that they'll be a testimony. Okay, and next slide. This is a verse. We say, but in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone, everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that is in you that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Gentleness and respect. Okay, we should not criticize. Okay, whether it is your family or your friends, family members. Non-believers funeral right. Don't criticize. Don't ridicule, and do not condemn. Just be present. Just be a tower of strength, and just be a testimony. What is my conclusion? Okay, we have to take the Bible is the basis of all matters of faith and conduct. Okay, and secondly, what are the personal consideration? Do I do this? Do I not do this? Consider whether this practice is against biblical principle teaching, and whether it affect my relationship with God, and also do I stumble others? That is very important, especially if we are in some sort of Christian、uh, leadership position in any way. Do my actions stumble others? Okay, and and so I want to conclude with this: a jellyfish. I introduce a jellyfish and a porcupine. What is the difference between a jellyfish and a porcupine? A jellyfish is actually not a fish; it is a plankton, and it is it is、uh, it has no brain, so it just not elementary nervous system, and then it will go as a current bring it. Okay. Okay. It is somebody said it is actually a watermelon with tentacles, ninety five to ninety eight percent water, and and then it is it is not a strong swimmer. It will just go at the mercy of ocean current. So that is a jellyfish. And how about a porcupine? A porcupine is a rodent with very soft hair, very soft. But it will, it will. But among the soft hair, there are very sharp quills on the back, at the side, and the tail. And the quills cannot be shot, but will be easily released. Okay. So what happens is, if it is a If you have sharp, those have sharp tips and overlapping scales of bark, it's difficult to remove once it's stuck in an animal skin. 
So the quills can be as long as 30, 30 centimeter long. And if it's embedded, it can be fatal. Okay? So we should not be a jellyfish. Okay, if you are jellyfish, whatever people say you do, go la, you go to the funeral, your grandfather said, do this, you do la, nail, you nail la, stand up, you stand up, love, follow. Then you be, be behaving like jellyfish. But we cannot be a porcupine or so. Fold your hand. I'm a Christian. I won't do this. I won't do that. And you become a terrible uh, testimony. But how about the second conclusion? It must be a light. Okay? The Bible said, let your light shine. Matthew 5, 60. Let your light shine. And 1 Peter chapter 3 said that, be prepared to give an answer with gentleness and respect. But there are two types of light. You can either be a candle that burn, 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 and the end burn out. But it can be an oil lamp. An oil lamp, the oil being the Holy Spirit that keep you growing. Okay? So, my conclusion is, the challenge to all of us is, we have to be a salt and light to our families. Okay? And secondly, we have to restore family relationship. If we ask ourselves, Chinese say, jia jia yu nian de jing. There will be distorted, be fractured family relation, and I think as believers of Christ, we have the Prince of Peace. They can help to cement, help to restore family relationship. Again, we must not be a jellyfish or a porcupine, but let us desire to be an oil lamp and not just a candle. Okay, uh, that's what my sharing. If you have question, or uh, shall we close in prayer? Uh, food offered to idols. Can we consume food offered? Well, wow, there is one whole sermon, you know. <laughs> if you go to the website, I actually did a whole sermon on whether we should offer food. Or, and I examined Corinthians. I examined the Bible passage from Romans. And I examined the Bible passage from Revelation. Okay? And because if you read the Bible, Corinthians and Romans, some parts say, eat. Then some parts say, all food is clear, you, could, you, you don't need to. Work. But some parts say, but if you look at the Bible, you look at the summer. One part is food sold at the at that point, very briefly, sold at the market because the market is next to the temple. So when you go to the market and you buy, you don't know whether the piece of food is offered to the idol. Okay, so generally is, if I go, if I go to my friend's place uh, for a dinner, if my friend were to let me know that it has been offered, I will not take. Okay, if I know. If I don't know, if I think I don't think I'll get oppressed, I will get depressed, I will get possessed just before because I know he who is in me is greater than he who is the world. But if I have been told that it is food offered to either and I still think, then even though it doesn't affect me, I be a stumbling block to others. Okay? I hope that answer very briefly. But if you want, you, you can go back to the message. I dealt one whole sermon of one hour, different aspect of whether should or should not eat food for offered to either. I think it is a challenge. Okay, I will give you this testimony. In Kuala Lipis, I have a, a girl who came to the Lord through us. And the father and the mother, her father passed, she got two mothers. Okay, first mother, then the mother couldn't give birth, so she got died. But it was amazing, the two mothers stayed together very harmoniously in the family. And then she became a Christian and she got baptized. And because she got baptized, she made a decision she will not eat food offered to idols. So she eat. So the first, sorry, the first time, few, a year or so, a year or so, she actually just eat vegetable. Lah. Then the mother saw it and the mother saw the change in her. The next time the mother said, told her, this has not been offered. You can take this. Okay, I hope that helps us. Okay, those of us who come from non-Christian family will probably change it. You will go to Qingbing, for example. They probably offer the whole thing and they eat it. Okay, I think if we don't eat meat for one day, we won't die. Lah, huh? <laughs> okay, I hope it helps you. Okay. Any other questions? Maybe I have a question. As to like marriage, right? Uh, when two families are of the same surname, in my mother's time, they say, no, you shouldn't be married. And is there, what's the reason for that? I think there, 
the reason probably I think they don't want close. They, they don't want uh, because genetically, if you're very close relative, you're genetically it could be double neck, uh, double recessive genes or something. Okay, so so uh, yeah, earlier you you, you packed all, then you say oh you cannot marry somebody. Else. But I think nowadays people are not so so what lah. Okay, mm. but fortunately we are ng ng different type ng, so we could get married. <laughs> He's a yellow ng, I'm a different ng. <laughs> okay. okay. I think now, I think that the reason was mainly that you don't want to be, I mean, for example, even now, if you want to marry a cousin, first or second cousin, probably you fall in love with first and second cousin, then you probably be strongly encouraged not to marry because of the close relationship, close genetic makeup. It need not be just on birth, on death, and marriage, right? It could be anything. Pardon? It need not be just on birth, life. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. If I can answer, yeah. I'm, I'm not a <laughs> cultural expert. <laughs> what? No? All right. So maybe Pastor, you close us in prayer. Okay. All right. Come. Okay. Pastor, would you mind close us in prayer? Come, let us pray. Father, we want to thank you, Father, for Pastor Kokmoy Lord, who uh, has... Uh, Explain to us in details, Lord, of uh, the birth, the marriage, and death, uh, that our traditions, our culture, our Chinese traditions and cultures, Lord. Father, we thank you, Father, for helping us to be, uh, to understand clearly, a bit more clearly, Lord, of all the, the traditions and cultures of the Chinese. Father, we pray that even as we learn uh, the the things that we can do and the things that we cannot do, the things that we can ret retain, the things that we can redeem. Father, we, we thank you, Father, for helping us to understand so that whenever we are faced with uh, uh, these, uh, these things that, uh, that we're going to face in the future, Father, we, we will know what to do, O Lord. So, Father, we thank you. Thank you, Father, for uh, being with us, O Lord, to help us to understand more. Thank you, Father, for Pastor Kokmoy, for Pastor Swimming, Lord. Uh, for being here uh, to have uh, this time with us, Lord, to spend out this time uh, with us. We thank you, Father. So, Father, we uh, pray that you grant all of us a good night's rest even as we go home. Father, we pray that you will uh, bless each one of us here, Lord. Thank you, Father, for this time of learning, a time of fellowship, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you.